Hey guys, this is Ori James Burner with the Painting with Sounds podcast. Um, welcome to the first episode of the podcast. Um, so I want to take a moment to explain how this is going to work. It's going to be on YouTube. Um, if you see the screen right now, this is a basically a digital chalkboard. So I will be writing notes and other things as we go through poems each week. So guys want you guys to be aware of that um, as for who I am I am a metrical poet from the Chicago land area um, and I specialize or I should say the type of poems I write are usually dramatic monologues um, generally in the form of sonnets that's kind of what I've been doing so they're both dramatic monologues and sonnets um, and uh, this podcast came about because I was giving a speech and some people said I should put some of the things I was saying online so here we go um, and the the main thing the main reason we're doing this uh, I'm doing this podcast is because to be frank uh, modern poetry just sucks I'm not saying all of it sucks I'm not saying um, there are some modern poets I really like but I'm saying the vast 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 majority of it sucks and the reason it sucks is, um, to be frank, um, a lot of people who are getting new into poetry are writing uh, first-person free-verse lyrics, which we will be looking at a lyric today that is not in first-person, just to show the contrast. Um, there is um, almost like an abandonment of craft going on. Um, a lot of people don't know what wordplay is. A lot of people don't know how to write poetic meter. They they say they hate meter, but they don't. If you were to ask them to write poetic meter, they could not do it. So there has been a kind of an abandonment of craft. Um, believe it or not, I really blame. Um, I guess you would say some of the more established published poets for this uh, unfortunate trend because of two reasons. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna lay them out now because I, uh, I am not going to get into this on this podcast. One is politics. Um, a lot of poets have a very left-leaning um, view of the world and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but they take it to certain extremes that um, kind of I feel alienate a lot of people who would be interesting in writing poetry. And the second thing is a lot of I would say published poets Tree is very. Um, I can understand it, but it takes quite a bit of. Um, you have to be very intellectual to understand it. To be frank, like you have to understand like a, quite a bit of Greek uh, mythology and some of the poems, which I'm not saying is wrong, but some some of them some of the references are so obscured. It, it, it's it's just not good. It's just it's not enjoyable. It's not entertaining. Okay, it's almost as if no one is running for the common person. Okay. Um, it's it's more like intelligent people trying to write for other intelligent people, and it is a um, just it, it gets very monotonous. And I'm like, okay, can we have something that's a little fun, a little entertaining? Like um, I like to use Edgar Allan Poe as an example. Um, like him or hate him, his poems are very entertaining. Okay, anyone, even people who don't really write or read other poetry will read his stuff because it is fun to read. And it is unfortunate that we have gotten away from that. Um, so that that's my deal. Uh, so general rule though, I am not going to be talking about politics on this channel. I have no interest in talking about politics on any channel. It is just not my thing. I just wanted to lay out a particular problem I am seeing and give a reason why I think it's happening. So with that said, uh, this podcast, we are going to try to be educating people that are interested in this subject, um, and we're going to be focusing mainly on the craft end of things, okay? We are not going to be looking at um, themes as much, um, and you'll hear this a lot, that poetry is very subjective. Yes and no. The theme, the subject matter, can be subjective, but the actual techniques that are used to give the poem its life are very objective. Are, we can measure them. We can see how well they are being used, and that is the side I'm going to be looking at. Okay. 
Um, so I actually want to start this by giving a, um, and this is going to be the working definition of how we're going to attack what poetry is, because I think it would be best to understand what we are trying to do. Uh, poetry is a form of writing, okay, that uses rhythm. Notice I didn't say meter, I said rhythm, okay, there's a difference, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, wordplay and structure to express or mimic a central idea, okay? Oops. So, um, I wanna kinda go into what the central idea is, okay? Um, anyone who's been around, or even if you Wikipedia, you will see that there are Poetry generally gets broken into three uh, categories. Um, lyrics, which is a poem about a, um, it could be an emotion, a thought, um, an event, like something you're witnessing, an action. They're generally very brief. Um, usually emotions and thoughts are what are gonna be written about, but not always. The above is not really an emotion or a thought. It is an event but it's still a lyric, okay? They're usually shorter, they're very short poems, um, but they can be a bit longer, but that is what a lyric is. Um, dramatic uh, poems, uh, this is somewhat Shakespearean, but there are other poets who venture in this. It's usually about a character or persona um, that is having a dilemma or conflict that they're trying to overcome or talking about, okay? And the last is a narrative. And this is a story poem, and I wanna I wanna use I'm gonna use Robert McKee's definition of a story. A story tells of a meaningful conflict that results in an irreversible change. Okay, Oops. fix that. Okay. This, this is important. That is what a story is. As So just to give you guys, or this as a story is what we are going to be approaching. Um, and this is what poetry is. Uh, a lot of people try to argue with me. It's just the emotion express, uh, emotional thought aspect. That is a diary entry. That is not a, that is not a poem. I'm going to be frank. I get this a lot. Um, and frankly, um, anyone who's been published or anyone who's really working on the craft will kind of reject that it's just an emotion or thought. But anyways, I, like I'm saying, the central idea is going to usually be one of these three things, I'm, even a combination of these things, guys. Like this isn't just like, you know, it's either a lyric or dramatic. There's li dramatic lyrics. There's narratives that use dramatic, you know, scenes in it. There are, you know, or a narrative that uses a lyrical, lyrical section, it, it, it's, it can be a little bit of a mix, okay? But I'm just giving you a general general view of it, okay? Um, so, and the other reason I wanted to do this, guys, is um, <laughs> I have had some friends who have gone to college for, and I mean like four-year college, uh, university, just studying poetry, and they are in their eyes up to debt um, and they are not they are not going to make the money back on this investment um, and I think that is sad um, I started it as more of a hobby I never you know I took a class like one class or actually I took two classes and they were just for you know fun classes they weren't like you know okay I'm gonna go and spend tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars on this it was just like oh, I'd like to you know take a class on what uh, what makes uh, the Iliad great. Oh, I'd like to take a class on iambic pentameter. That Those were the two classes I took, by the way. Um, but it wasn't like, you know, I spent, you know, semester after semester, like, going into different different areas of this. It was, this is just a hobby that ended up, I ended up like, excelling at. And, like I said, some people, I gave a little bit of a talk, and some people said I should do more stuff on YouTube. Um, so, here I am. So, uh, the last thing I want to get into, guys, is I kind of want to get with the format of uh, what these podcasts are going to be on a weekly basis, um, because I just to give you guys 
some structure. Um, first, we're going to have an introduction, which we're doing now. Then a brief lesson. We're going to look at a poem, which the poem will always be posted like it is here. Um, then we're going to talk about the rhythm of the poem, the wordplay of the poem, the structure and meaning of the poem, and then I'm going to give it like a brief conclusion. So that's how each episode is going to go out. Okay. And if there's any questions, uh, just leave them in the comments, and I will answer them in the introduction of my next podcast if the question I find is relevant to what we are discussing. Okay. So now that we got the uh, basis out of the way, let's get into the actual lesson today, and it's going to be a very simple lesson, guys. And I want to. There is there is a lot of poetry out there. There are tons. You you could read all. You could spend every day probably reading something and never get through it all. So I wanted to kind of narrow the scope of what we are going to be looking at um, in this podcast. Now I'm going to give you guys um, some primary sources, which I think everyone should read. These are everything you, you need to have read this, because otherwise, because a lot of poems are based on not only the subject matter of these um, works, but they are also a lot of torque, uh, quote unquote, wordplay like wordplay devices or formulations come from these older poems. So it's very important to understand like where people have are getting the not the the subject matter, but like the uh, like a simile like similes appeared once, right, guys? They it somebody had to come up with the idea of a simile, and it appeared in certain poems, and then other poets saw it and they started doing their own similes. But there's other, like I said, there's other devices besides similes, okay? It's just an example. So I want to give, I'm a, and then the second category is going to be secondary, and that's going to be stuff that is personally interested, interesting to me. Uh, but I use the secondary readings, guys, that, that's going to be your own, your own flavor, your own personal taste. Um, I've tried to, I'm not, obviously, couldn't list out everything. Um, that we're gonna do, I'm gonna go over. But I wanted to give like a variety of poets, um, from contemporary to ancient, um, to um, World War One, to stuff like that, uh, just to get give you guys a little bit of a flavor of what I am, uh, what I'm gonna be giving you. Okay, um, and like I said, there's tons and tons and tons of poets out there. Um, even modern poets, I have a few that I, I particularly like. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So. For the primary poems, guys, um, the three. Oops. Three, the three sources, guys. Um, number one, and this this is probably not going to make a lot of people happy. Um, the Bible. Okay. I'm not here to argue the validity of the Bible. That um, if you are interested in that um, type of debate, I suggest you either look um, up. Sentinel Apologetics or um, Frank Turek from uh, Cross the Zam. They, that's that's their field. Very nice gentleman. They'd be ha more than happy to have that debate with you. Okay. What I am talking about is that a lot of the stories and even the images from the Bible appear in poetry. Um, it's unavoidable. I think people even even some atheist poets use uh, imagery from the Bible not realizing it's from the Bible. It is just it is just saturated in our culture. You're not going to get away from it. So I'm not saying you need to read the whole Bible through all the way beginning to end, but um, give you kind of uh, some ge uh, gist of what you should read. Probably Genesis, Exi uh, the first half of Exodus, um, Samuel and Kings, a lot of people write about. Um, story of uh, the Gospels they write about, uh, Reve Revelations a lot of people write about, um, some things that occur in the wandering, uh, not the whole thing, but you know, these, these, these events, these stories are written about over and over and over again, it's just not avoidable. Um, the other thing I would suggest is, um, is Shakespeare, okay, this he is, and I mean everything Shakespeare, he, he is a fantastic poet. And I would actually read, it, it's interesting, I would read, uh, if you get his complete works, they, they're not 100% sure what works came first but they, and what came last, but they have a pretty good idea of like the order. There might be one or two off, but it, it, it shows you, if you read his works through, it shows you the transformation from where he started to where he ended. So it's, I would highly suggest you read it in that way. That way you get an idea of how people, um, you know, 
people uh, grow in this craft as they practice and continue on. Um, and I actually want to make that this point because um, I see this a lot. You you don't need to um, whatever poem you're writing right now does not need to be perfect. I view it like this, guys, and I think this this gets lost on a lot of people. Work to your best of your ability on getting whatever poem or group of poems you're trying to write done to the best of your ability. Release it, learn from it, and then write new poems based brand new different ideas um, based on what you've learned from reading writing your previous poems because a lot of people they get in a cycle like this poem's gotta be perfect it's gotta be perfect it's gotta be perfect and they work on the same poem for years and years and years and it really stunts them just accept that you're gonna make mistakes or you're gonna not always hit the mark but you just gotta keep growing and moving forward okay there's always there's always something else to write about okay um, and then the, uh, the last are the great epics, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go into this. Uh, the great epics um, would be uh, foremost uh, the Iliad, okay, and the Odyssey. These are both by Homer. Um, these are this the Odyssey, the uh, Homer, and the Bible are pretty much the basis of all our um, all of our literature guys even non -po poems it poetry it, this this is it guys you need to read Homer and the Bible at the very least and I think Shakespeare is like number three on that list um, but some other epic poems you should also be um, reading is um, Virgil the uh, the internet I never can spell that right <laughs> uh, yeah like that um, Dante's *The Divine Comedy*. Okay, this this is a, this is actually the poem that got me into poetry, *The Divine Comedy*. Um, and uh, John Milton's uh, *Paradise Lost*. Okay, uh, these poems, guys. These these seven. I or Shakespeare's more than one poem, but th these seven works, guys. This is it. Like, if you read this, you would have a very and understood it. Like, really understood what was being said in here. You would have a very un, strong understanding of the whole history beyond that. Um, so I, these are the seven that I think are primary readings. You, you gotta read them no matter what. You don't, you don't have to agree with them. You don't have to like the people who wrote them. But the, these are it. These are the primary works. Okay. So I want to go into secondary. What? The other type of poets I will be looking at. Like I said, everyone's got to have their own, I guess, canon, you want to call. Um, so, there's probably a poem, an epic poem you guys thought I'd put. Um, Ovid's The uh, the Metamorphosis. I, I, I've read this. It's not a particular enjoyment for me. Uh, but, should be read. Um, who else? Kate, for something a little bit more uh, contemporary, uh, Kate Light. Uh, I particularly like her poems. Um, another contemporary is Blue and Jazz Poems, guys. I love Blues and Jazz Poems. Um, I, I think um, I would buy any collection that's a Blue or Jazz Poems uh, collection. I think they are, um, most of the writers are African American, and I think they, they write about, you know, living on the streets, sex, um, drugs, not all of them, but some of the ones I've read that I've enjoyed. Um, I'll probably be looking at a lot of this. These, I think, are great poems, okay? They are very real. They're very entertaining. They I, they really capture the grittiness sometimes of life. I like, I love these poems. I really do. I might just do a, like a year on these eventually. I just love these, these type of contemporary poems. Um, some other people that we should be, uh, Robert Frost, particularly enjoy. He is very good at dramatic poems. Uh, I, I admire his dramatic, his, his ability to make a drama. Um, Emily uh, Dickinson, okay, this, I'm sure everyone has heard of her. Um, William Blake, very, his stuff is crazy, guys. His stuff is crazy. The imagery, it's just bizarre, it's weird, it's awesome, it's entertaining, okay? 
very entertaining. Like if you read his poems, let go with the drawings. It's it's just amazing. I I like I wish I'd see more of this in contemporary stuff. I really do. Um, reading uh, Keys, I I have a particular love for this guy. I I think he's great. I his stuff is just haunting. Um, who else do I got here? Um. Uh, some poets don't particularly like Edgar Allan Poe, um, and I, I, I don't, it, they think he's a little bit vulgar, is some of the, but I don't really, again, he, he's entertaining, people like to read The Raven, everyone has read The Raven, it is just one of those poems that people, even who have no interest in poetry, love to read, it is just entertaining, and that's the type of stuff I think people should aim to write, stuff that entertains the common person okay that I think he does that magnificently I really do um, who else have I oh um, Lord Tennyson which will be the these first uh, six uh, six episodes guys we're gonna be looking at Lord Tennyson um, I'm not gonna go through everything I'm just gonna do six poems I thought of his that I enjoy um, Robert Brown Another, another, he's a contemporary of Lord Tennyson. Um, this one, uh, this is a contemporary. He just passed away about, ooh, not quite 10 years ago. Derek, oop, Walcott, 1L. Um, again, another poet I particularly like. Um, these, these are pretty much what are going to be the guys we're looking at. Like I said, there's other people I might pull out a particular like one one onesie twosie poem from their works, but these are the guys. These are the guys we are going to be looking at. A lot of these guys and a lot of these guys. Um, the last thing in this lesson, guys. So I want you. So basically, what I want you guys to do is these seven must read and then I really want people to think about well what type of poems do they write like um, these are the ones I enjoy but you really need to find your own like canon your own niche okay um, the last thing guys I want to get into is um, the material we're going to be working with um, uh, for beginners okay we're going to be there's five books I suggest everyone get that uh, there's a lot of like begin like where you should begin. Um, I think these five will help um, a lot more than some of the other um, poetry poetry books. Um, only one of these is really written for beginner poets, but um, all five I think they they just they'll they'll give you um, the resources and tools to start writing. Okay, they might not teach you how to put the poems together, but they'll provide you with the basic tools um the first is and this this is a but I, I love this book that i'm about to suggest I, I read it probably once every other year um all the fun in how you say a thing by uh, timothy Steele. um this book will teach you how to write poetic meter okay this this is a fantastic book i this is a must-have okay actually all five of these books are must-haves okay um i Again, we're going to be going into a lot of the concepts he teaches in the book, but I'm not going to go over every paragraph and every. Um, he gives a lot of examples. I'm not going to use any of his examples, but I'm going to use the basic ideas from his book to explain uh, what we're seeing in the poetic meter of poems. And by the way, guys, all the poem, uh, actually not all, but about 90% of the poems we're going to be looking at is in poetic meter. Um, like I said, it's not that I don't like free verse. I just think a lot of new poets use free verse as an excuse to write poems that have no craft in it. And they just say, oh, it's free verse. Well, no. Free verse means you have to create your own structure and your own rhythm. It doesn't mean you are excused from not using those things. So that's, that's kind of why I'm going to be looking at structured poems. But like I said, I will be doing a particular free verse, probably episode 7. I'll be showing a free verse poem that I particularly like and explain why I like it and the things you can take from it. Um, but anyways, that is for rhythm. That's this. Um, for wordplay, um, this is a very popular one recently. Um, if You've probably heard of this. Uh, Elements of Eloquence. Okay. 
and this is by uh, Mark Forts. Um, this again is a um, must have. It's going to teach you a bunch of wordplay devices. Um, some that we're even going to see in this first poem. We're going to see a, a, things that he talks about in this book. We are going to see in this poem right up here. Okay, so that is a must have. Number three, guys. Um, irony. And this is a non poetry book right here Irony and Sarcasm. Um, a lot of poems have a, kind of an irony. This is by Roger Cruz, by the way. I uh, have a lot of a, a little bit of an ironic twist to them. Um, basically, let me use the Iliad. The Iliad works because it has a sense of dramatic irony behind it, right? The reader who who um, who understands the history of the Trojan War understands a lot of the foreshadowings that the characters do not realize within the story, and that it works because of irony. Okay, um, so this is a this is a very at the least, I, this book, like I said, it's not written for poets, but it will teach you how to start thinking in, in an ironic way. Um, and not all poems have to have irony in it, guys, but a lot of them do, and it kind of helps you want to see it and, and implement it, okay? Uh, the next book is a um, the vocabulary... Um, builder by uh, Chris Lely. Um, again, poets use words, and the more words you have or know, the more words you are going to be able to use in your poems. This is super important. Okay. I have in the past when, like, sometimes, like, man, I wish I knew words because I keep reusing the same words over and over and over again, and you begin to, like, oh, man, these ten poems use the same words. It's not good. This will help. This will help immensely. There's a lot of vocabulary builders out there, but this one I particularly like because he breaks it down into lessons. Like, rather than like it's, some of them I've seen are like kind of like a dictionary. Like they just you know give you a bunch of new words that's off A and then B. This is more of a lesson. It's he makes it fun. Um, the last is, and um, this is a this is a very it's a book uh, from a literal critic um, Helen um, Venler. Um, it's the art of Shakespeare's sonnets, Helen. Um, and basically, guys, what it, what I like about this book is it, it takes everything from these first four books and it shows you how a professional, like a like a poet that most poets aspire to be, how he uses everything that was talked about in these first books. How he uses it in his craft. You you can just see it beautifully. She points out wordplay, rhythm. Um, though she, it's not so much. She like I said, not every. I'll be going into more rhythm than she does um, in these poems. But she does talk about like poetic meter. Uh, but her big thing is on like the uh, the structure of the poem and the irony. But you get. To, but she does point out like I said instances of rhythm and uh, wordplay when she feels like it's appropriate to what she's talking about. But either way, you guys get to see how everything that was discussed in the first four books is used in the real world. That's why I like it. I think that's a great cap off to um, to anyone who's a beginner poet. Okay. So that uh, those are, the, like I said, I know it's not much of a lesson, guys. It's more of like, different books you should be buying and reading, but I feel like this is the basis of everything we are going to be talking about moving forward, okay? So, like I said, um, these first four books, we're going to be, especially these first three, we're going to be looking at stuff in these poems, um, and then eventually I will be, probably after we get through Tennyson, uh, probably episode nine, I plan on it. We're going to get into Shakespeare sonnets, maybe after ten, but somewhere around there. So, with that said, guys, I really want us to look get into this first poem. I think I've given you guys enough stuff to, like, you know, start looking into and thinking about and digging up. Um, so this first poem, The Eagle by Lord Tennyson. <clears throat> he claps the crag with crooked hands close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. He watches from his mountain walls. And like a thunderbolt, he falls.
Okay, guys, this is a very brief, uh, very brief poem. It is a lyric. Um, I picked this poem because I wanted to show that you can write a lyric in third person, like this is. It doesn't use the word I once or you. It's all all third person. Um, because like I said, one of the big things I have a problem with right now with a lot of modernized lyrics is they're all I, 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 I. It, it gets a little obnoxious. It's And trust me, I'm not one of the big nature poems. I, I, I kind of like more surreal stuff. But um, this, this, this just goes to prove the point of what I'm talking about, how it does not need to be first person. Okay. Um, so there are some interesting things um, going on. Um, like I said, the first thing we're going to look at is the rhythm of the poem. Um, I want to look at this uh, first line, guys. Um, and I'm going to, this is an iambic uh, tetrameter, guys. And when I do this first line, you will see the, uh, the rhythm. It will be really pointed out. So I'm going to highlight the beats. He claps the crag with crook. It hands okay so you guys can kind of see the beat there's four beats put and this pattern um this pattern the da dum da dum da dum actually repeats in the first line and all these lines but it does not repeat in second and third it's, it's very similar but he starts with a trochi opening and these two lines um so it would actually be close ringed right and then the rest of the poem so we just kind of broke that foot off but the rest of the line is an iambic as you see the sun in lonely lands so we're going to do lonely and lands so you can see after that first trochee switches to iamba this is this occurs a lot in iambic poems guys a lot of poems start uh, a lot of lines and um an iambic poem will start for Trochi and then switch over to I iambic. It's very common, so don't get freaked out when you see it. Um, and then as world, right? We see it as your world. He stands, right? And uh, next lesson, guys, we're going to go into why certain words or syllables or have a beat while others don't. Um, I just want you guys to see the rhythm right now. And then next next episode, we are going to explain why these words or syllables have beats. Okay. Break this apart beneath. crawls right I hope you all hear in this beat like I said I'll read it again once we and then he watches from his mount ten walls okay And like a thunder bolt, so we put thunder and I'm hoping we're all seeing the seeing these uh, the beats okay I hope you're hearing it when I say it out loud and like I said I'm gonna read this one more time with now everything highlighted so you can really see see what I'm talking about so he claps the crag with crooked hands close to the sun in lonely lands ringed with the azure world he stands the wrinkled sea beneath him crawls he watches from his mountain walls and like a thunderbolt he falls so that my friends is the rhythm of the poem and like I said next episode we're going to discuss why these syllables and words 
like why this beat is created. How is it created and why these particular words take the beat? Like why does the claps take the beat and not the he? Why does the crag and not the the? Like we're going to discuss that next next episode. I just want you guys to see the beat and understand that a lot of poems have a type of beat. It's not always iambic, but they have a type of beat behind them. Okay? So that I'm going to make a copy of this because there's some other stuff I want to look at. Um, but that is the rhythm of the poem, guys. Um, and now I want to kind of get into the uh, wordplay of the poem a little bit. And there is a, quite a bit of wordplay in this um, that is probably not noticeable right off the bat. Um, first, guys, there is uh, quite a bit of alliteration. Um, so let me put this right here, guys. Um I will write it under here. Alliteration, guys, is um, when you string words together that start with the same letter or sound. It's actually sound. Um, so. Um, let's let's highlight what we find, guys. Um, so let's start. Off, there's a uh, three, yeah, three that I found. Uh, three uses of alliteration in here. The first is with the C's. So I'm gonna just underline all the C's we find in the poem, right? Look at that first line, right? We got three words that start with a C, right? Claps, crag, crooked. That hard sound. If you look at the second line, we got close. So tens on. Uh, we got crawls later on. I mean, it's a short poem, so. And that's the thing. Uh, alliteration doesn't all have to happen in the same line. Um, it can appear, you know, later on, like it does here. So that's one. Um, and then look at this uh, Lonely Lands. So we got that double L going on here. That's another example of illi uh, alliteration. And then the last one, and this one is uh, probably, you got to really look at it, is the RW. They both have that world sound, world, ring. Okay, they're very similar in sound. Some people might not consider them the same, but I, they, they're similar enough for me. And if we look at the next line, we see wrinkled, right? More Ws, watches, walls, right? So... We can kind of see, you know, we got the C's repeating, we got these W, R sounds repeating, we got the um, Lonely Lands, right? I mean, we, if you really want to, you could do the like. But I don't think, uh, I don't really think he was thinking of alliteration when he used the word like. But it, you could make the case for it, but Lonely Lands definitely, definitely was in his mind when he did that. Um, Let's see, do we see anything else? Ah, uh, C and Sun. I'm not, not entirely sure that was uh, what he was aiming for, but you could probably do that too. But as, but definitely the C's. And I think definitely the W's and L's. Right? Definitely was something in his mind when he wrote this. So that's a wordplay device, guys. Alliteration. It's a very simple one. I I highly suggest you use it. I use it all the time, all the time. Um, but there's two other um, there's two other really good uses of wordplay in this, and the first is actually um, I'm gonna point out the obvious one. It's a simile. We have a uh, like a thunderbolt he falls right. So I'm gonna just highlight the uh, I'll bold this. We got this simile right here, um, and the trick of a simile, guys, is you're comparing two things that are similar, hence the name simile. Um, and you gotta think how like. Thunderbolt and an eagle, is that is that a good simile? Are they alike? Well, I guess you could say they both fall, or they look like they fall. Um, uh, another thing is they are both, I guess you could say, of the sky. Like, that's their dominion, the sky. Hell, even the sun, you can argue that image is with the sky. But really, um, Thunderbolt and eagle, just, so you got to think... Like how they are like, and that is how they are like. Um, so yeah. Uh, so by the way, so let me put that down. Simile. Uh, 
comparing two things that are alike. Okay, guys? The simple, everyone likes simile. Actually, I think these two are probably the two best, um, I think, of the two best devices to start with with poetry. Similes and alliteration. They're very simple. They're very easy to use. Um, now, I'm going to say this about a simile, and this is pro tip. If you have um, multiple similes in your poem, make sure that they, there's a there's a common thread between all of them. Example, like, uh, let's say he had a couple other similes in, um, in this. I would have, again, like a simile to a cloud, like a comparison to the clouds, a comparison to the sun. I would, I would keep all the similes being, you, you're comparing the eagle to stuff that you find in the Skyly Dominion, right? I wouldn't do a simile to a thunderbolt and then simile to like a warrior on a battlefield or then a simile to like a uh, flower blooming. That, that gets a little like, what's the common thread? There is none. Uh, but if you use, but if you can think of a common thread, that binds all the similes together, it, it makes them more powerful. It gives the poem power. Okay, so that's my tip. Um, keep keep all the similes united with a common theme image, right? Now the last um, this last. Uh, wordplay device might be a little hard to see. Um, I'll be honest, on my first reading of the poem, I it didn't, it, I mean, I saw it, but it didn't really click with me. I'm like, oh yeah, he's doing that too. Um, it was actually on my second reading I saw it, and that would be, um, there is a per personification, yeah, that's that word, personification. It's a personification, guys, that he is using. Um, and that is, I'm going to see if you guys can find it before I highlight it. It's where you give a non-human thing to be, and I'm going to just leave that general thing, a human quality. Okay. Given a human quality. And if you have not found it yet, um, it is right here, this first line in the second stanza, uh, the wrinkled sea crawls, right? That's basically what's going on. The wrinkled sea crawls. The sea is doing a human thing. It's crawling, right? Um, personification, another great, great device. Um, and as you guys can see, we got like short poem and we already have uh, three devices we also have end rhyme here like we have hands land stands crawls walls falls um, I'm gonna be doing a whole lesson on end rhyme because there's a little bit more to it than just um, having sounds that sound like at the end of the line there's, there's an art to it but he does use that too but really the three I would like people to concentrate on is alliteration, similes, and personification. These are great devices for brand new poets to use today. You can do them right now. Um, so the last thing is I want to go into the structure of the poem, guys. Um, yeah, let's start a we're gonna look at it. And uh, so, like I said, the pattern is the rhyme pattern is a. A, A, and this is B, 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 right? Two stanzas, all three lines each. All of them have like the same, end in the same end rhyme. A, 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 B, B, B. Not, not very complicated structure. It's very easy. Again, you could probably do this yourself. Um, but there is a particular interesting thing I want to look at in this poem, and it's how... Um, something I think a lot of people would not notice about this and it's the final word in each of the stanzas they oppose each other in a way right in this and I highlight them he stands right and it's not really it's not like he's standing up it's more of like a static description he stand or he is standing would probably have been a better way to describe it right but he stands I, the last word uh, phrase of the 
of the second stanza is he falls, right? It's they're, they're almost opposite, guys. One is standing, the other is falling, right? And I don't believe that was an accident. I believe that is very pur purposeful in him doing that. I believe that is what he was aiming for. And it kind of gives you, um, like I said, a um, gives you an idea of how how you should be thinking about your poems. Like stuff like this is um, very subtle, but very powerful. It, it gets noticed. Like I said, I just noticed it. So, like I said, I believe this first one's like if you can envision the poem. Um, it's kind of very the first the first paragraph is very or first stanza is very static. The second one is more action based. There's like a a difference like let's just say yeah i guess he, claps is a um a verb like he's doing action but really when you think about it, he's like close to the lonely sun he's close to the sun and the lonely lands and it's just i i just feel like this is this is the setup and then look at all the action we got crawls he watches he falls it's it's just very different, a very different stanza. One stanza, like I said, I think the first stanza is more of a passive stanza. It's setting up the image, and then the second stanza is you see the image in motion, right? That that's that's part of the poem. That's part of the structure. Okay, this was this was done on purpose. Um, and like I said, so here let's just put that down, right? First stanza, static. Second, action, right? Um, and th again, this is something you can do. You can have, I, I highly encourage you people like this, have a, like, you know, similar to this, have the first stanza just be a static description and the second stanza an action. You can use, you can use everything he's used, the meter, the end rhyme, or you can vary it a little bit, but it's, it's just a very simple poem and it's a very, um, well crafted poem. And that's the thing I want you to look at is the craftsmanship that went into this. Poems don't need to be, you know, 100 lines long with all sorts of twists and turns. They could be just simple description and action things. And, um, and uh, some people might say, well, what's the meaning? There's no depth to it. I, I don't think poems always have to have meaning and depth, like soul-shattering meaning and depth. I think they can be, like I said, fun. They can just be simple. They can just be, like, a child could read this and understand it and possibly even appreciate it with all the sounds in it right i think that makes it it's successful in my opinion this is a very successful poem um and, and not, i would rather have a very a poem about a guy writing about an ego that you that's well crafted versus a poem about heartbreak that is not well crafted okay i'm going to take the ego poem so that's that's kind of what i'm hoping you guys get out of this um so I want to kind of wrap this up, guys. We've gone over a lot. I've given you stuff to like start buying, looking for, give you what primary poetry. Again, the Bible, Shakespeare, the Iliad, Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Divine Comedy, Paradise Lost. Gave you some ideas for secondary poetry, but that that you're gonna have to think of yourself. That that's gonna be personal taste. And then I gave you guys what I consider the five best books for beginners. I promise you, if you read these books and really implement what they are you they are teaching into your poems, you will probably be better than 90% of the internet poets out there. Lord knows I use a uh, a lot of everything in these books. Um, so let's kind of just wrap it up here, guys, in this first episode. Um, first, um, the, the thing I really want to stress, if there's one thing I, I stress, because everyone starts with lyrics, because lyrics are pretty... Pretty every punch, all poets start at lyrics. I started at lyrics, moved my way to dramatic monologues. Everyone does it. But lyrics, guys, don't need to be first person. If you got one thing out of this, that would be it. Um, and then the second thing I really want us to um, remember is that poetry, and I think you guys can get this, poetry focuses on both sound and image. Like, like, like look above it, guys. This poem right here, lots of sound, as I pointed out. Lots of sound in the poems, and it still uses imagery, right? We got description of the ego, uh, we got like a thunderbolt, wrinkled sea, mountain walls. I mean, look at that. We got all Azure World, which is 
kind of an interesting way. That's an interesting comparison to the sea. That's how. That's what he's calling the sea. I just it's just all all wonderful images, right? But there's a lot of sound too. So I think the like if you take away these two lessons, guys, lyrics don't need to be in first person, and poetry focuses on both sound and image. Um, you'll get a lot from this because I I'll be honest, I read a lot of poems that don't use any sound. Okay, they don't they they are tone deaf. They don't use rhythm. They don't use alliteration. They don't use rhyme. They don't use anything that adds a little bit of fun to it. And that, that's a shame. That is a shame. Um, and then I read the poem. And then I actually read opposite too. I'll read poems with no imagery and all sound. Um, and I actually do prefer that. If, if you had to pick one or the other, I would prefer you use the sound. And then I read poems that don't use either or. And I'm not even sure if I really would call them poems. But to everyone their own. Um, so that pretty much ends this uh, episode, guys. In the next episode, we are going to um, really be looking at poetic meter. We're going to I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to it, namely iambic pentameter, which is the most common poetic meter in English. And I'm going to explain why it works, how it works, what does what, and show you um, show you some um, variations and substitutions that appear in iambic pentameter. And then we're going to look at another one of Tennyson's poem that uses a lot of what we're going to cover again. So, I hope you guys got a lot out of this first lesson, and I look forward to the next one. Have a good week.